So could it be then that masturbation is part of a three-state issue for God rather than being a two-state issue? In other words, rather than thinking about the whole thing in terms of right and wrong, good or evil, should we instead think of masturbation in terms of best, worst, concessionary? After all, it is very closely tied to the three-state issue of marriage and divorce. Remember, with marriage and divorce, God's best for us is lifelong marriage. His worst is fornication and his concessionary position is divorce. When it comes to dealing with the sexual impulse then, could it be that God's best for us is lifelong marriage, his worst is fornication, and his concessionary position is masturbation. In this episode, we're gonna go through each of these three points in turn, starting with the top one. First of all, God's best for us is clearly that this incredibly powerful sexual impulse is taken care of within a marriage environment. We can say that much with certainty because it is explicitly stated within the Bible. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, now regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The husband shall fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. So here Paul is saying that it would be good if people could abstain entirely from sexual relations, but the reality of the thing is that if they were to try, sexual immorality would creep in. Paul makes it clear here that this is one of the primary reasons why marriage exists, so that each person will have their own husband or wife to take care of their sexual needs within a safe covenant relationship. But notice also here that as a nod to the power of the sexual impulse, Paul says that abstaining from sexual intimacy should only be done for limited periods of time. Now, why is that? Well, it's because the sexual impulse's power grows through neglect and eventually that becomes dangerous. After a while, self-control will start to become a problem and Satan will more easily tempt them as they begin to hit the red zone. This is what I was trying to illustrate in the previous episode with the graphs and the talk of the rev counters. The advice here is that you don't want to neglect your sexual impulse for too long because the sexual charge will begin to grow and eventually that will reach dangerous levels. Lustful thoughts, loss of control, temptation, sexual immorality, these are all risks that grow with time if the sexual impulse is not met. Paul goes on to say that he wishes everyone could remain single and entirely focused on godly matters all the time, but he acknowledges this is simply unrealistic. He says, but I wish everyone were single just as I am, yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. Paul seems to be suggesting here that he personally has a low sex drive and the sexual impulse isn't a particularly big problem for him to control. That's one of his gifts. Obviously, there will be others who have the same gift too. However, he acknowledges that it is unrealistic to expect everyone to go through life without their sexual needs being met. Therefore, he makes the concession that everyone should find a spouse to help them keep away from sexual immorality. I say this as a concession, not as a command. Of course, God's worst for us in sexual matters is obviously fornication. This is a thing that we have to avoid at all costs. And again, we can say that much with certainty because it's explicitly stated in the Bible. To the Ephesians, Paul wrote, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Whenever the phrase sexual immorality occurs in the Bible, the root Greek word is usually pornea. Pornea can specifically be rendered in English as fornication, whoredom, or idolatry. So Paul was specifically warning against sex outside of marriage here. In the church today, you're increasingly going to hear people saying that sex outside of marriage is okay, that God doesn't mind it. That's just the way that culture is moving right now, and so the church is kind of being dragged along in that direction too. They're wrong. Fornication outside of a marriage covenant is the absolute worst case scenario. That's explicitly stated in the Bible time after time after time. For example, the Bible says, God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. To the Corinthians, Paul wrote, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. 
Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality. To the Galatians he said, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures. Now, there were some words in those verses that some would argue could also include masturbation. We just saw vague words like impurity and lustful pleasures. Some would say that masturbation also falls under these categories. And certainly we can't dismiss that idea. Indeed, we're going to come back to that angle in the second half of this series. However, since pornea only specifically refers to fornication between two people, all we can say for sure at this point is that those are the impurities and lustful pleasures we have to avoid. Sex without marriage commitment is the explicitly stated worst state of affairs in the Bible. That's what we know for sure at this point we have to stay away from. Whether or not these terms also involve masturbation, we're going to come back to that in the second half of the series. This is quite a densely packed episode, so I hope that it's all making sense so far. So far we've established that marriage is the best solution and pornea or fornication is the worst. Those two things are explicitly defined in the Bible. It's about to get just a little bit more dense, however, because the Bible also tells us that God isn't only judging our outer actions in these matters. He's judging our inner thoughts too. He's judging our hearts. Jesus said, You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In other words, it's possible to commit an internal fornication, an internal pornea. Now, it's at this point that one of the strongest and most common arguments against masturbation comes into play. Many people would say, Okay, the Bible never specifically says not to masturbate, but it does explicitly say not to look lustfully. Jesus said that's adultery of the heart. Now, is it possible to masturbate without looking lustfully? No, therefore masturbation is wrong, not because of the act itself, but because it's inextricably connected to looking with lust. You can't do it without looking lustfully, therefore you can't do it without committing adultery of the heart. Now, this argument has got a lot of substance to it. However, it's not as clear cut as it first appears. Indeed, you may see a paradox beginning to emerge in this episode. You see, we've just established with biblical support that the longer a person goes without a sexual release, the more likely they are to burn with lust, be tempted by Satan, and stumble. Remember, that's why Paul was exhorting people to get married and not abstain from sex for too long, because if they deny each other, control will become an issue. Each person should have a partner to help manage this force, otherwise its power grows through neglect. There's actually another verse that feeds into the same idea. Paul says, So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. Again, the idea here is that people with no sexual outlet will begin to burn with lust. They'll struggle to control it. So this is the paradox. This is what I refer to as the lust paradox. If you do masturbate, then you're likely to be lusting at the time. That's adultery in your heart. That's a sin. But if you don't masturbate, then it doesn't go away. In fact, it gets worse. You'll start burning, losing control, and lusting anyway, which is sin. It seems that we're trapped by the sin of lust if we do masturbate, we're trapped by the sin of lust if we don't masturbate. Both options, doing it and not doing it, both bring you back to the same place, which is the same sin of lust, adultery at heart. And that's what makes this such a tricky subject to wrestle with. Now, there's only one explicitly affirmed solution to this problem in the Bible. We've already heard it multiple times. That is to get married. That's the answer. Indeed, that's the only solution that Paul ever offers to this. He keeps pointing us up here. Get married, get married, get married. However, as simple as that does sound, what if a person doesn't have that option immediately available to them? What if a single person is being forced through no fault of their own to live for years without a partner? I mean, it does sound very simple. Just get married. Why wouldn't you get married? But it's not like there's a shop you can go to. So is there any legitimate way for a single person to successfully defeat the lust paradox? Someone who doesn't have this option yet? Well, what if a person masturbated without looking with lust? To merely expel the semen in their body in a pragmatic, functional way. If they're not looking with lust at the time, then they're not committing adultery at heart. So that's okay. 
and at the same time they'll be dampening the sexual pressure to safeguard them for the future. <sighs> it's only because of this lust paradox that any kind of argument can be made for masturbation. What if a single person is masturbating not to indulge his lust, but to escape it? Since we know its power grows through neglect, then if the buildup of semen is starting to lead him into sin, it's causing him to stumble with his eyes and his heart. If he's feeling unbearable sexual tension, if he's becoming distracted by it, if inappropriate images are starting to flash uninvited through his mind, if it's becoming a more difficult battle to fight, he threatens to be overwhelmed and lose control, and he knows that he can quickly stop it all with just a pragmatic release of the semen in his body, is there a case for saying that he should just go ahead and do it? He can't lift himself from this position through marriage yet, he doesn't have that option, but he can lift himself from this position through what appears to be the next best thing. Such a person would be masturbating not to lust, but to escape from his lust. This isn't ideal, it's not the best, but that's not really the argument we're considering here. The argument is whether this could be an acceptable concessionary position. Now I'm not saying one way or the other yet, I'm just trying to help us think about this very tricky situation. In the same way that divorce is not ideal and yet there is a concessionary case for it, is there a case for saying that masturbation isn't ideal, it's not marriage, but in the absence of marriage, can this be something that helps keep people away from the worst? I'll keep repeating that the only explicit solution the Bible ever gives to this dilemma is marriage. But outside of marriage for a single person, we do seem to have arrived at a nearly impossible situation here. If you do masturbate, then you're likely to be lusting at the time, just sin. And if you don't masturbate, unless you have a gift for it, a low sex drive like Paul, then you're likely to end up here anyway. You're going to start burning with lust, which is sin. I'm a little bit concerned that I'm going to be misunderstood here, so please forgive me as I try to summarise the problem one final time in this way. This verse says not to look with lust, and that seems to preclude masturbation. But this verse and this verse say that if there's no sexual outlet, then you'll struggle with immorality, self-control, Satan will tempt, and you'll burn with lust anyway. Now, the solution the Bible offers to this conundrum is to get married. But if you're not married, and that isn't an immediate option, then is there any way at all for a single person to avoid all these pitfalls, to avoid immorality and being tempted and burning with lust. So this is really the core of what we're wrestling with now. How do we solve this paradox? How do we defeat lust in a God-honoring way?